Uh, I have four pieces and uh, the time's kind of tight, so if you feel like applauding, please hold it till the end. I've been very blessed. As long as I can remember, my life has been accompanied by music. Moments and memories are recorded and then replayed in my head whenever a song connects to a memory. My parents are part of the great generation. They listen and dance to the sound of the big bands. My childhood is filled with the music of the 40s and of the words to every pop song before I even start school. As a teenager, my mom was a Bobby Soxer, a proud member of the Russ Colombo and Frank Sinatra fan clubs. Their framed pictures still hang in our living room wall, attesting to their stature as virtual family members. When Russ Palumbo died in a plane crash, my mom mourned in true Italian fashion as though she'd lost a relative. When I'm six, my parents buy me a bow tie and a Frank Sinatra sport jacket, chocolate and tan with wide lapels just like the one Frank's wearing in the picture on the living room. I love it and I love Frank Sinatra. That innocent generation of pop music fans unwittingly gives birth to a new generation of music fanatics, greasers and rockers. At 13, I listened to the only black radio station in Philly, WPLJ. Jocko Henderson's the DJ, and he's really cool. I hear work with me, Annie, for the very first time. Listen to that dirty sax screeching and wailing. My body wants to move. I want more of this stuff. The backbeat of the song, Shaboom, gets stuck in my head. I beg my mom for 75 cents. I go to Nipper's record store, and I buy my first 45 record. I listen to R&B on the radio, but I want to know more. The main library of Philly, I become a student of the blues. They're recordings from the Library of Congress, and listening on primitive set of headphones, I discover Lead Belly, Blind Lemon Jefferson, Louis Armstrong, Bessie Smith, Chicago Blues, Barrel House Piano, Ragtime, and Jazz. As long as I feel the beat, I'm addicted. I can't get enough. R&B gives birth to rock and roll. I know immediately this is my music. I can't afford to buy a record, so I go to the local soda shop on days when the guy puts new records in the jukebox. I beg him to sell me the old used ones. I guess he sees that hungry look in my eyes, and he sells me the old ones for 25 cents each. A young addict connects with his first dealer. <laughs> After school, when my parents are still working, I take long swigs of Seagram 7, and I dance alone in the basement to the beat of the music. Little Richard and Jerry Lee Lewis are my dance partners. At 14, I go to YMCA dances and I watch the dance contests. Hell, I could do that shit. I study the dancers until I find a girl that I think feels the music the same way that I do. I work up the courage to ask her to be my partner in a dance contest. She agrees, and we click and we easily win the very first dance contest we enter. I soon realize that with the right music, mostly little Richard and Jerry Lee, and the right partner, I can't lose. My mind and my body enter a kind of altered state when I'm dancing, as though watching myself from above. It's not me dancing, it's the music and the beats taking over my body like some mystical religious experience. And it's addictive as any drug could ever be. I'm inexhaustible and unbeatable. I never lose a contest. In the mid-60s, I'm still collecting R&B, rock and roll, blues music, and I discover British rockers who, like me, have been immersed in American blues music. The Stones, The Animals, Clapton, Van Morrison. I'm still dancing, but not in contests anymore. I'm in New York City now, so it's endless Soho loft parties with hopes of free booze, drugs, and getting laid. That works for me, too, for a long time. <laughs> I'm everywhere. There's always the music, synced with my life and locked in my memories forever. The Stones, James Brown, Neil Young, Tom Waits, Marvin Gaye, The Temptations, The Four Seasons, Aretha Franklin, Janis Joplin, Chris Christopherson, and Martha Reeves, The Four Tops, on and on it goes. In the 80s, disco fever strikes New York. I don't like the beat or the sound, it's too plastic for me. I abandoned pop music for the sound of outlaw country music, whose writer-performers absorbed the classic Grand Ole Opry sound, added electric and a heavy backbeat, and moved from the Opry to the back rooms of dive bars, where they're embraced by a whole new generation of country rockers. Waylon Jennings, Willie Nelson, Johnny Paycheck, Hank Williams Jr., David Allen Coe, and Johnny Cash. I feel the beat and I love the lyrics. They sing of freedom and a life outside a world of suits. Country goes Vegas. Back to the roots of rock and roll again for me. I'm loving that hard beating sound of punk and indie bands popping up all over the East Village where I live. The rhythm, the beat, the sound echo endlessly in my head, connected to images in my life. 
My body still responds when I hear and feel the beat of music. The music's in me. It's the soundtrack of my life. This is called Bruno and Bambi. Bruno and Bambi are high school sweethearts. They grew up in Jersey City during the late 70s in a tough blue-collar Italian neighborhood. They both had that Jersey Shore kind of swagger without the arrogance and stupidity. First time he looks into those big brown doe eyes, Bruno knows he's going to marry that girl. Her name's Philomena, but to him, she'll always be Bambi. She wears a school ring on a gold chain around her neck. He carries her picture in his wallet. Bambi's petite, but far from delicate. Anybody gives her shit, she comes out swinging. She's also pretty, feminine, and sexy as hell. Bruno's a thick, health, huckle, the tough guy. A soft heart and a hard fist. You mess with him, you get laid out. One punch, it's over. Bambi gets pregnant just out of high school. They're both more than willing to commit to marriage. The parents aren't happy, but they offer a full-blown Italian wedding and a reception. Lots of relatives, lots of food, and lots of music. Everybody's happy for them, wishes them well. They settle in a small apartment in Hoboken. Bruno's uncle gets him a job as an apprentice in the Electrical Workers Union. They eagerly await the birth of their son Guido, a laughing eight-pound bundle of joy. They save every penny they can, and after three years they put a down payment on a new house in Richfield. Bruno, ever the flashy Italian, buys a mint-used cherry red 76 Caddy Eldorado convertible. They both love to drive around their old neighborhood in that caddy with the kid, the roof down, the radio blasting out oldies. They want everybody to know how fucking cool they are. Life's good. Bruno works his way up to chief shop steward position in an office job at Union Headquarters. When he visits work sites, he always seems to be accompanied by some young, sexy, and fawning assistant. Bambi isn't stupid. She assumes that Bruno, like a lot of Italian husbands, will always have a guma on the side. She seems willing to accept that in stoic Italian wife tradition, as long as he provides for the family as a loving husband and father. He is. His dalliances don't appear to bother her. Their middle class life settles into a comfortable routine for years, until a routine mammogram reveals a lump in Bambi's left breast. It's malignant. Three harrowing years of treatments and medical bills leave them both run down, tired, and broke. But she's still alive. Tough Jersey kid, she survives all this. And together, they rebuild her strength and their marriage. She continues on as the good wife. Guido's in school, Bambi has a lot of time on her hands. She gets a job as a receptionist at a local real estate office. A year later, she decides to get a real estate license and become an agent. Bruno's still working at a steward's job and continues visiting word sites with his sexy young assistants. If Bambi knows, she says nothing. After three years as a real estate agent, she tragically has a reoccurrence of her breast cancer, just short of five years after the first. The news is emotionally devastating for both of them. This time it's worse. She undergoes a double mastectomy. Along with radiation and chemo, she's offered some options. Her team of doctors want to take her noticeably thick muffin top, use it to rebuild her breasts while preserving her nipples and eventually adding breast implants. She agrees. The result is an amazing transformation from Bambi. Now almost 50, her body takes on the appearance of a much younger and sexier woman. She eventually returns to work, also joins a fitness program at the local gym. She spends three to four hours, three to four nights a week there and is looking strong and sexy. Bruno gets a text on his phone saying Bambi's having an affair with some muscle head at the gym. He's shocked, but he really doesn't believe it. He shows it to Bambi, she says, must be one of those younger, ugly girls at the gym who's jealous of her. She would never cheat on Bruno. A month later, Bruno gets another text about Bambi having an affair, and it includes the phone number of the alleged muscle head's wife. Tells him he sh she's kicked him out of the house for scooting around with Bambi, and that he should call her if he doesn't believe it. Again, it shows it to Bambi. She curtly replies, he's accusing her of having an affair and she doesn't like it one bit. Come to the gym with me, we'll work out together. You'll see. He does, for two months. But he can't help noticing frequent glances and looks from one of the young trainers. He decides to check Bambi's cell phone records. Finds hundreds of calls to that trainer's extension at the gym. He's crushed. He confronts her with the evidence and this time she doesn't deny it. She says... Payback's a motherfucker, ain't it? And she smiles. 
There are loud threats and arguments, followed by a restraining order against Bruno. He isn't allowed near his own home anymore, so he's sleeping in the caddy till he finds a place to live. Bambi's having lots of fun with her young lover. I guess that's kind of a happy cancer survivor story, you think? <laughs> always find Johnny E in the last seat at the end of the bar for happy hour at the International on First Avenue near 7th Street. Three Fingers Bushmill, neat. Always dressed to the nines with a carefully arranged and shellacked comb over, wearing that classic powder blue polyester sport coat he got 43 years ago with 72 on his way home from Nam. Hey, Johnny E, I haven't seen you for a while. Where you been? Ah. Fucking ambulance took me to emergency at Bellevue and sent to VA hospital. Eight weeks I'm there with pneumonia, and then they tell me I got a bad liver to boot. Goddamn landlord rents out my apartment to some woman with a kid. Cause he hasn't heard from me, he thinks I'm dead. 35 years of my life he throws in a fucking dumpster. And then my car's gone. I go down to Topan. They auction up my car for 75 bucks. They said I owed $2,300 in tow charges, fines, and storage fees. Hey. I got 468 bucks in my saving account. I'm running out of fucking options here, you know? He spends happy hour at the International for a few more weeks till his stash runs out. Just trying to stay warm, keep a little buzz going. So weather gets colder, panhandling ain't working for him anymore either. I run into him again. He's sleeping on a heat vent by the Chase Bank on 2nd Avenue. I spot him at 20. Hey, Johnny E, how you going, man? Rejoice, rejoice, we got no choice, right? I need to try the VA again, huh? I was a door gunner on a Yui back in Nam, you know. Company A, 1st Battalion, 35th Infantry. I lit up a lot of fucking VC with that big 50, man. No retreat, no surrender. Fucking A, brother. They owe us something. I don't see Johnny anymore that winter, on the street or at the International. Late one night, I'm over at the Black and White on 10th Street, shooting a shit with Harry the Hat. Out of nowhere, he says, hey, remember Johnny E? Frankie the cop told me he found him dead in a room over the St. Mark's Hotel back in November. Yeah, face down on a Swanson TV dinner. Mac and cheese, I think he said. Still wearing that fucking polyester sport coat. Hey, you know what's sad? Frankie said nobody claimed his body. You believe that shit? Hey, Billy. Three fingers Bushmill. Neat. For Johnny E. No retreat. No surrender. Fucking A, brother. Late night East Village, rain glistens off shattered street glass like fallen stars. Blondie and Boho roam in the streets. Long legged beauty in full length leather, taking long strides in black cowboy boots. Blonde hair blown wild, open coat, denim mini skirt, and Ramon's t shirt pushing out hard nipples. Dragging along that old hipster Boho, sporting a black pork pie and Chuck Taylor high tops. Looking for all the world like some sexy 60s truck and cartoon couple. Coyotes stuck on that stalk in Alphabet City, hungry for the taste of pre-gentrification, looking to bite off and chew the last remaining conversations laying out there for music, poetry, love, and art, lingering in dive bars still open for poets, rockers, artists, and crazies. A broken wing angel and a poet out of rhyme, juking the East Village dive bars, drink a little, dance a little, making out at the bar, not caring who's looking, feeling the music, feeling the love. They hit the street again, on the prowl, hungry for the next joint. They just keep rolling on, bar after bar, till there ain't no more left. Drinking too much, talking shit, laughing too loud, groping under street lights, refusing to submit to daylight, ever. They're dancing on razor blades, but they taste freedom in the blood. Their time's passing fast, they know it. Soon there'll be nowhere left to go for poets, rockers, artists, and crazies. Fuck burning candles at both ends. Douse them in gasoline, turn up the music, drink, smoke, laugh, make love. Let the flames be your final sunset, because baby, you got nothing left to lose. Thank you. <laughs>